this course this course uh, focuses on the interplay between mathematical foundations and observations and that is because i really feel that the center of gravity of, of uh, kind of the uh, of the world the main main force so to say um, has really shifted I mean, for a number of years, you know, people like Roger Penrose, Steve Knocking, Bob Garrosh, and others contributed greatly, and Andre Troutman contributed greatly to the uh, to the work of mathematical found mathematical foundations. But since about eight years ago, gravitational waves were found, were discovered, and now I think really the focus has shifted to observations and the relation between the foundations and observations. And that is why I'm not speaking only on the mathematical foundations, which is really a very beautiful subject in its own right. I could have spent all six hours on it, but I decided to really do this because I think for younger researchers, that is where the frontier is be between the mathematical and conceptual things and observations. Okay, so the main point is that the field has grown enormously and therefore it is difficult for young researchers to grasp even in broad terms the conceptual and mathematical foundations of the theory, since these foundations are rarely discussed in the specific areas in which re researchers in gravitational waves work today. So the purpose of these lectures is really to fill this gap. And as I will discuss, the notion of radiation requires global and rather subtle constructions, and they were, the, they were sort of introduced to dispel the confusion about the reality of gravitational waves. And I believe that every theoretical researcher, whether you are a numerical relativity person or approximation method person, one should be aware, at least in general terms, the way that these difficulties associated with coordinate invariance are overcome in a fully gauge invariant manner and mathematical quantities representing physical observables are extracted. So this is what we're going to focus on. So today, today the first lecture is going to be just on I'm sorry, here it is. The first lecture, first two lectures are, are, are associated with the uh, subtleties associated with uh, gravitational radiation already in the Maxwell field. And the second lecture uh, will go, go over to the, to the gravitational field up here. I realize that many of, for many of you, this, this part may be a little bit elementary, but I think not for, not for everybody. And I think that's why it's good to start at the beginning. Uh, I will pause at various stages to ask if there are any questions. So let us begin. <clears throat> so electromagnetic waves. Now, this, let's just consider, uh, to begin with, uh, general relativity and to find out what is the radiation content of a solution is tricky to identify. And that led to a lot of confusion about the re reality of gravitational waves, as we'll see at the end of this lecture. Um, and we'll see that Einstein himself contributed to this confusion, and these notions were clarified in the 60s. And some aspects of this confusion are present already for Maxwell fields, and since all of you are completely familiar with Maxwell fields, let us begin there. So we begin with Minkowski spacetime with metric eta AB, and the Maxwell equations up here, and which assume that the sources have support, uh, which are they're smooth, and they're support on a compact spatially compact world tube, so they don't go out to infinity, the charge sources that I got up here. Maxwell field, of course, goes out to infinity. And the main issue is that we cannot really extract the radiative content of a Maxwell field FAB at a finite distance from the sources. There is no local criteria to say that we have got radiation or we don't have radiation. Now, when I say this, people immediately point out, but what about the pointing vector? If there is a flux of pointing vector across some surface, then clearly gravitational waves are carrying away radiation. And this seems like a natural criteria. But in fact, it is not. And simple example is really, you can just take the Coulomb field of a point charge. So in a rest frame of the charge, the electric field is just given by this, magnetic field is given by that. And therefore E cross B is of course zero because magnetic field itself is zero. But if you went and boosted, and if you looked at the same system in a boosted reference frame, so keep the physical system same, just boost, boost yourself to a boosted reference frame. For example, in the z direction, then you will find 
that the new electric field and the new magnetic field are such that A cross B is not equal to zero. And therefore, we can introduce three surfaces across which there is flux of um, momentum. Uh, so therefore, this, this pointing vector is not a good criterion. Uh, it is not a Lorentz invariant notion of any um, of presence of radiation. <clears throat> so therefore, the question is, what is radiation? And usually, it is really said to be one upon r part of the field. But you cannot extract one upon r part, part of the field if you are given solution just locally. For example, in your room, if you know the solution, you don't know how to get one upon r part of the field with respect to the sources. So you need to go to the far field region. And mathematically, that corresponds to r equal to infinity. And therefore, the radiative part is kind of a global concept. Now, a precise way to, to do this is to bring um, a, to infinity to a finite distance. This is finite. To a finite distance by an appropriate conformal transformation. And this is Penrose's completion. Now, you already have had some lectures on conformal completion. And the organizers told me that you, you would be familiar with Minkowski space and conformal completion. So I'm going to be extremely brief. So we take Minkowski metric and you introduce a retarded instrument of time or the, and the advanced uh, uh, the coordinate of time up here. And then I'm just going to first look at the retarded because I want to look at what happens at stri plus as, as you go to the future. So then just with u equal to t minus r, you get the metric in this particular form. And r is equal to, as r goes to infinity, because of these factors, the metric is not well defined. But if you can formally com complete it with a conformal factor one upon r and multiply this by the omega squared, then you find that I get omega squared and then du d omega and uh, d omega squared. So now at infinity, you can use omega and u and theta and phi, u and theta and phi in this up here, um, u and then omega instead of uh, omega instead of r. As coordinates, you find that this metric is perfectly well defined e1 and r equal to infinity, and therefore we add this boundary, which is future boundary, which is r equal to infinity, as you go away from the sources in the u equal to constant directions. Um, but of course, omega equal to zero is not part of Minkowski space. It is really because it corresponds to little r equal to infinity. So we're attached a boundary to Minkowski space, and this is a completion, and this boundary is called scribe, and the endpoints of this boundary are null geodesics, future directed null geodesics of Minkowski space, they have their final endpoints on this graph here. <clears throat> As scry itself, omega is equal to zero, therefore the metric is just left with this part up here. And therefore the tangent vectors to scry itself, to the three manifold, are just given by d by du, d by d theta, d by d phi. d by du points in this direction, d by du points in that direction up here. And then you've got d by d theta and d by d phi. And d by d phi and d by d theta are angular coordinates. Each point up here is a two-sphere. And d by d theta, d by d phi are tangential to that two-sphere. Uh, <clears throat> scry is a null surface. <clears throat> um, because if you look at the, the, take this metric, the four metric is perfectly well defined. It is non-degenerate. But if I pull it back to scry, then Omega is a constant on scry, therefore this term disappears, and we're just left with a two metric up here. So that shows that the signature of the intrinsic metric is zero plus plus, because this is a two dimensional plus plus metric. And d by du is a null vector, and that's a null normal to scry. So we can also use advanced coordinates instead of retarded coordinates, advanced coordinates up here. And if I did that, then we get uh, scry minus. So we get scry minus up here, just like with u coordinates, u equal to u, u naught, are, you are going to scry plus, u, v equal to v naught, you are going to scry minus. And now one can also introduce null tetra, which are convenient basis to expand field. So this is important to re remember. So Na is supposed to be the, this really grade of u, if you like, it is, uh, u is given, given up here. And so I can just define ua like that, LA like that, LA like that, and then M and M bar, uh, M is a complex vector and M bar would be the same vector with a I in front of I, I would have a minus sign with M bar. Um, these are 
I mean, uh, these are clearly space a linear combination of space like vectors, but they are complex, and therefore the norm is null and uh, is zero, and therefore n, l, and m and m bar provides us with a null tetrad such that n dot l is equal to minus one, m dot m bar is equal to plus one, and all other inner products are zero. Now, for the rescale metric, omega squared times eta AB, the null tetrad can be defined to be, this is something that you can check. I'm giving you, leaving the exercises up here. You can check here that n hat is equal, to, if we just set n hat is equal to n, and n hat is equal to r squared L, and m and m hat, uh, and m hat related, and m bar hat related to, um, <clears throat> And 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 uh, and and, and uh, m hat and m bar hat, but by this formula, then again I get a null tetrad. But the important thing is that this hatchet tetrad is perfectly well defined as scry, whereas the unhatchet tetrad that we began with is not well defined as scry. For example, R is not a good coordinate at scry, and therefore uh, R is infinite at scry. Therefore, these are not well defined. But in fact, and these are well defined. The important part part up here is that n itself. Is um is is uh, and hat itself turns out to be uh, perfectly well defined. I don't have to rescale it, and as a result, and hat has to be rescaled by R squared. So the hatted vector fields admit smooth limits to scry, and the un and for unhatted vector fields, indices are raised and lowered using uh, the physical metric, and for the hatted vector fields with the conformally rescale metric. And the conformally invariance of the Maxwell equation says that if I just set f equal to f hat then just because f satisfies Maxwell's equations, it's also true that f hat satisfies this Maxwell's equation. And since the source is as com spatially compact support, uh, near, near scry, this thing is going to be zero, both in, the, uh, in both frames, the hatchet and the unhatchet frame. So scry plus is a regular submanifold in the completed space time. And f hat equal to f is a smooth tensor field. The reason is because f hat satisfies Maxwell's equations, the, the hatchet Maxwell's equations, with respect to the metric g hat ab or eta hat ab. And eta hat ab is perfectly well defined on scry. And therefore, I can just forget about the physical metric and I can solve Maxwell's equations in the conformally rescale metric. And of course, scry is at a finite distance with respect to the conformally rescale metric. If I have some source like that, then of course the field up here is going to be perfectly well defined as far as scry is concerned, uh, as far as the unphysical un metric is concerned. Okay, so um, right. So what we can do is we can take this f hat ab, which is uh, which is just the same as f ab, and I can define the following quantities. I can define phi two, phi one, phi zero. F, the physical Maxwell field has six components and these are three complex scalars that capture those six components. So F is, the, phi two is defined to be one index is contact with N and other is a spatial index, the angular index and bar. Phi one is defined to be one index contact with N, other with L and the, the other two are M and M bar. And phi naught is just m and l here. Now, as we just saw, n hat is equal to n, and therefore n and hat is equal to n up here, but m bar is equal to m bar hat upon r. Now n hat is well defined as scry, m bar hat is well defined as scry. Therefore, this quantity is perfectly well defined as scry. So that says that the physical quantity phi two has a leading term which goes like one upon r. And this coefficient is being called phi to zero. That zero just says it's a leading term plus one upon r squared. When it comes to phi one, n and n hat are the same, but l is equal to l hat divided by one upon r squared, and m is equal to one upon r, and m bar is equal to one upon r. Therefore, both of these terms fall like one upon r squared, and therefore phi one behaves like a leading coefficient upon r squared plus one upon r cube. And for the same reason, phi naught falls like one upon r cube, the leading coefficient 
this falls like one upon r, this falls like one upon r squared, therefore I get one upon r cubed. Um, so if you like phi two naught, you can think of as just being this quantity, which is f, f hat, the, 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 the conformally rescale space-time Maxwell field with a conformally rescale space-time null tetra. And similarly, here I can think of it as being just this quantity with a hat head everywhere, and similarly find final. So these are the Newman Penrose components of Maxwell field. And I got specific fall off as one goes to scry. And this is just a fact of the, this is just a consequence of the fact that F hat AB um, is perfectly smooth tensor field at scry. F hat AB is smooth tensor fields. And then all these hatted null vectors are also smooth. And that just tells us that in fact, the physical space phi two, physical space field phi two must fall like one upon R and the coefficient is one up, is, is phi two naught and so on. So here is an exercise. Check that this peeling property holds. In other words, just do the calculation that I just mentioned for you. And if, if you just said A equal to A hat is a potential for FAB in the gauge A hat, A hat equal to zero, then show that the phi two naught is just given by taking the A and looking at its angular component and then taking its time derivative or d by du derivative with respect to m. So A, M, A, phi 2 naught are the two radiative modes of the electromagnetic field because they fall like one upon r up here. So phi 2 or phi 2 naught, if you like, um, which is the coefficient of the one upon r component is called the radiation field. And if I went to the uh, potentials, then the angular component of the potential, A times M bar A, that is called the, that cap, that has the information about the radiation content of the space time. So we return to the question we began with, what is the radiation content of the Maxwell field? We wanted to say it is one upon R part, but now we have ma made it this precise by going to scry and we can isolate the one upon R part, namely in phi two naught. The one upon R squared part is in phi one naught, and this is called the Coulombic part because it falls like one upon R squared. The energy momentum and angular momentum carried by the electromagnetic waves, they are all expressions as integrals or scrum, as we'll see in a minute. Okay, are there any questions? I cannot see you, so if there are questions, you have to speak up or Adam can, can say that there's a question or there's no question. Please raise your hands if you have questions. So, Adam, there are no questions. I can go ahead. Yes, it seems so. Okay. So, let's now talk about uh, energy momentum and angular momentum carried away by the electromagnetic waves. So, to begin with, if you give me a space like plane, so if you give me So for example, in Minkowski space, if you give me a space like plane like that, sigma, then in a Minkowski space time, I can so say t equal to zero. Then in Minkowski space time, I can calculate what is the total energy across here. So I, to define energy, I need a unit time like vector. I think I call it TA, no, yeah. So the unit time like vector will be TA. This is a, one of the killing vectors. KA stands for killing vectors. And I'm looking at a, a time translation vector field. And therefore, what I do is I integrate on sigma the stress energy tensor times TA. And then I integrate again on the, on the thing. So I get it if you like DSB, or if I like, you can write it as epsilon B um, MN P. So there's a three form, and you can integrate on a, a three manifold. So it will be that, or, or that is the same as just. In Minkowski space, I can take TAB. Now, if I take T equal to zero surface, then the normal to the surface is also T. So it will be this times D3X. So you are familiar with all these expressions that you can take, and that will be the total energy. So the total energy would be given by that. If I wanted momentum, then in place of T, I would have to put a space translation vector field. For example, you need that space translation vector field ZA. 
and I'll get that momentum component. If I wanted angular momentum, then instead of this, I just put here the rotational killing vector field and I will get angular momentum. So you are all familiar with that, that the total energy or the flux of energy across a Cauchy surface is just given by sigma. Now what I can do is I can take this Cauchy surface and take t equal to zero surface and take the limit of this uh, t equal to zero surface. This t equal to zero surface looks like this, t equal to constant surface like that. And t equal, if I take the limit up here, then these surfaces will actually go to scrap. So the flux across the t equal to zero sur uh, surfaces, if I take the limit up here, I will guess, get integral on scry of this particular quantity. Alternatively, some people like to look at time like cylinders. So I can look at R equal to R naught cylinders up here and take the limit as R, 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 the cylinder goes to infinity. So this will be equal to R equal to R naught instead of T equal to T naught and take the limit as, as, as I go to infinity up here. <clears throat> so if I did that, then I, I, I can find, I can just substitute for TAB to be F times F minus, um, minus trace. And I can just convert this. This is a physical space time. I can convert it to the conformally rescale space time. F is F hat, F is F hat, and G is equal to omega squared times G hat AB. And I calculate this integral. First express this integral in terms of the hatchet quantities and then take the limit because the hatchet quantities are all perfectly well defined in the limit up here. And you will find that the flux of energy across up here is just given by, so this is the energy flux, is just given by phi 2 naught whole squared. Phi 2 naught is the one that I would saw up here. It's just given by f hat a b, n hat b, n hat a times n, n bar b up here. And similarly, the flux of the z component of momentum will be just given by phi 2 naught whole squared times cos of theta is because it is z component, I get cos theta. If it was x component, I'll get sine theta cos phi. Y component, I'll get sine theta sine phi. Du this guy. So we're just doing this integral of this quantity. So what this shows is that indeed, phi two was supposed to be the radiation field as we saw up here, phi two was supposed to be radiation field. And it is correct because the energy radiated away is completely given by this phi two. The momentum is given by phi two. And similarly, you can calculate the angular momentum and verify that, in fact, the angular momentum radiated away would be zero if phi two not very equal to zero. Okay. Um, okay. So this is an exercise uh, for you to check that this formula are true. And so what we have talked about so far is really focusing on this one upon R part of the Maxwell field. What about the Coulombic part, this part up here? So it turns out that the real part has information about the electric charge and the imaginary part has information about the magnetic charge. Now normally, and if with the usual sources that I got, total magnetic charge is equal to zero. That is why we can increase the vector potential. That's why we can increase the vector potential. And so you can check that the total electric charge is indeed given by the integral of the real part of phi one naught. Remember the real part of phi one naught, I mean phi one naught, this part up here is a coefficient of one upon R squared part of the field at, at infinity. So in fact, phi one naught actually captures the total charge. So the Coulombic information is contained in, in, in phi one naught and the radiative information is contained in phi two naught. This reconfirms the inter interpretation of phi two naught and phi one naught at scry as capturing the radiation and the Coulombic parts or Coulombic content of the uh, given solution. If phi two naught is equal to zero, then there is no energy momentum or angular momentum that is carried away across scry. There are no electromagnetic waves. Similarly, we can do the same thing as scry minus. I did everything here as scry plus up here, but I can do the same thing as scry minus. I can again take t equal to constant surfaces and take the limit. And in that case, you will find that uh, the peeling properties are kind of reversed because n goes to l up here and n and l are like interchange when you take u goes to v and therefore the radiative part is in m times n m times l instead of <clears throat> m times n and the coulombic part however is still ln is the same thing 
So it's the same as chi plus, but this is different. Now it is phi 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 naught, which has, in other words, m times l, which has the information about the radiation. So if you want to say there is no, I'm looking at retarded solutions, so I got some source up here, and I'm only looking at retarded solutions up here. If I want to say that, then I'm, I have to say that at sky minus, there is no radiation field. So I say that phi naught at sky minus should be equal to zero. So by going to sky, we can really isolate these radiative degrees of freedom. So asymptotic flatness at null infinity in general relativity. The idea is again <clears throat> that one was, wishes to isolate the gravitational radiation in a solution of Einstein's equation. So it's the same thing. What we did was we in Minkowski space, we went to scry and isolated the radiative degrees and the Coulombic degrees of freedom or the Maxwell field. Now we want to do the same thing for general relativity. If we wanted to just do linearized gravity, we can repeat what we just did in the, Max in the Maxwell case. And the Maxwell tensor would be uh, replaced by linearized wild tensor, and we can do the, this procedure. But if you want to look at full nonlinear general relativity, then there are conceptual and mathematical subtleties that arise. Again, we need to go far away from the sources. We are going to scribe by taking u equal to u naught and r goes to infinity. So we're going far away from the sources. But now there is no natural r coordinate because the distances are defined by the metric itself. And metric itself is a dynamical field. So we have to be more careful about what we mean by this. And this is what raised a lot of confusion in the early days because with one choice of coordinates, it looked like a solution had radiation and another type of coordinates, it looked like there was no radiation. So what loop may look like time-dependent solutions in one coordinate system may appear, sorry, time-independent solutions, so stationary solution, may appear wave-like or out, uh, an undulating in another coordinate system. <clears throat> uh, because, for example, what looks like a time-like killing vector field in a coordinate patch is in fact a boost-like killing vector field and not a translation. And there's a very well-known well example of this, which is the so-called Levi-Civita C metric. It was discovered by Levi-Civita a very long time ago, I think in 1919. Um, and this metric seemed to have a, kill, a time like killing vector field, and therefore people thought, therefore it has no radiation. But then some other people <coughs> did, co did coordinate calculation and found that the solution was undulating at infinity was wave-like infinity, and therefore there was a lot of confusion about whether there is a radiation in this metric or not. This is just a concrete example. It's not a very deep fact, but it focuses the ideas, provides the illustration, illustrates why there was so much confusion. And this was really clarified, complete in full nonlinear general relativity, relativity only in 1918. The solution was found in 1919. So there's a uh, six decades um, of, of gap between them. And this led to a lot of confusion about the reality of gravitational waves. <clears throat> Einstein had derived the quadruple moment formula in the linearized approximation <clears throat> that I mentioned before. You start with Minkowski space, and we linearize the nonlinear Einstein's equations. <clears throat> and then in the language I mentioned, that's not the language Einstein used, but the language I mentioned, you can construct scribe and you can calculate the radiation and you can relate it to the motion of the sources, particularly the rate of change of uh, quadruple moment, the source up here. And <clears throat> so this was already done with first in 1916. There were some errors in the paper which were corrected in 1918. But still, until 1960s, there was a considerable confusion about whether gravitational waves exist in the full nonlinear general relativity. And this was clarified fully by Bondi, Sachs, Newman, Penrose, and others. And that is why I will discuss in the, this is what I will discuss in the next two lectures. And this is the foundation of all current work in gravitational, for, on gravitational waves. But for those of you who may not know this fascinating history about the confusion, about the reality of gravitational waves, here is a brief story up here. <clears throat> in 1916, as I mentioned, Einstein actually had the quadruple moment formula 
showing that in general relativity admits gravitational waves in the weak field approximation because he only considered linearized Einstein's equation. And there are a complete parallel to Maxwell theory, and but in striking contrast with Newton Newtonian gravity. In Newtonian gravity, there are no waves, but in Maxwell theory, there are. And the linearized gravity analysis showed that it was similar to the Maxwell theory rather than to Newtonian gravity. But then, you know, <clears throat> some 20 years later, based on his work with his then postdoc, the research assistant, Nathan Rosen, Einstein sent a paper to Physical Review entitled, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? And on the same day, he wrote to Max Bond saying, together with a young collaborator, namely uh, Nathan Rosen, I have arrived at the interesting result that gravitational waves do not exist, though they had been assumed to be a certainty in the first approximation. This shows that nonlinear gravitational wave field equations, in other words, full nonlinear Einstein's equations, tell us more, or rather, limit us more than we had believed up to now. So Einstein is saying that, yes, I had seen that there are gravitational waves in the weak field approximation, but that was an artifact of the weak field approximation, and in the full general relativity, there are no gravitational waves. And Einstein actually had submitted three papers, landmark papers, in 1936 to physical review. <clears throat> One was the Einstein Rosen waves, uh, Rosen bridge, and then the other was about the, um, the EPR paradox. And both of them was were accepted at once, but only this paper was sent to referees. It was quite amazing that the young um, uh, editor of Physical Review had the great foresight to think that there was something not right about this paper. And it turned out that the, it was later found that the referee was Al Robertson of uh, Robertson Walker University. And he wrote an eight page report showing that there was an error, not in the solution itself, but in that conclusion. Basically, that concluded that gravitational waves don't exist because of a certain singularity. That singularity was a coordinate singularity. Einstein and Rosen had very curious reactions. So, what I, the paper, Einstein just withdrew the paper from physical review and submitted it to the Franklin Institute, where it was I, I accepted at once. But in the proofs, Einstein reversed the conclusion of the paper and changed the title also. So the, 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 the title was, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? Then he submitted it to the physical review. And it was changed to, On Gravitational Waves. And the abstract said, now said, also changed, now said, that um, a rigorous solution of cylindrical gravitational waves is given. For convenience of the reader, the theory of gravitational waves and their production, already known in principle, is given in the first part of this paper. After encountering, encountering relationships which cast doubt on the existence of rigorous solutions, these are the coordinate singularities, uh, for undulatory gravitational fields, we investigate rigorously the case of cylindrical gravitational waves it turns out that rigorous solutions exist and that the problem reduces to the usual cylindrical waves in Euclidean space. It's a very beautiful paper, but conceptually Einstein himself made a mistake and that really propagated for a very long time in the whole, whole, whole literature up here. So I can just ask here now, uh, just tell you what, what happens now uh, in, in, in the next lecture, I will tell you what happens in full general relativity, how we can actually objectively quantify whether they are gravitational waves or not. If there are, then what is the energy they carry away, angular momentum they carry away, what are their physical properties, and so on and so forth. So I would like to stop here a few minutes earlier than I you know, than planned, because I would like to see if there are questions. Please don't hesit to, hesitate to ask questions, even if they seem like trivial or this they may seem like why are you doing this etc uh, i'll also like to get a feedback whether i'm going too slow or too fast so please raise your hands and give me the feedback and ask questions any questions any uh, comments yeah uh, can, uh, can you hear me sir 
I I wanted to ask like when you were defining uh, like radiation in the Maxwell field and then we were continuing to radiation in general relativity. So yeah. I wanted to ask like because there is no concrete definition of let's say gravitational wave energy. So uh, if I have a space time, let's say it has standing electromagnetic waves, and if I want to study the energy content, so can I study it with the method which uh, which which is right now in the screen? or it, does it does it needs to be a space time which has which can be conformally transformed or something like that or yeah no i think if it is a curved space time in order to talk about radiation you would need to uh, make a conformal completion which we are going to discuss in the next next lecture uh, so you will need to do conformal com completion even to uh, even for the maxwell field right and the statement is that you, if you have curved space times that are asymptotically flat in the sense that we'll, we'll explain in great detail, which basically generalizes the notion of asymptotic flatness in Minkowski space. So in that case, again, you can use exactly the this, this same formula that I've written down, provided the solution itself is asymptotically flat. Right? So if it's a physical solution, by that I mean the solution is actually coming from say, some bounded source. Then it satisfies these conditions. There is no problem. You can just use the retarded solution, retarded integrals to find the solution and show that it will be asymptotically flat. All these quantities that I talked about, uh, phi naught, uh, sorry, uh, these quantities that I've talked about here, namely phi naught, naught, phi one naught, etc., they exist in that case. Now, your question about the first, you began by saying that in in general relativity, we don't have formula for energy carried by gravitational waves. That is true only at, if you want to, there is no well-defined notion of gravitational waves or energy they carry away at finite distances. And the problem is the same that I mentioned before. Namely, I don't really have a notion of, in fact, if I have gravitational of electromagnetic waves or not, I don't have that notion even in, in Minkowski space time. So as I said, for electromagnetic waves, this is an exercise I really, really urge you to do this, that you can start the Coulomb field, which everybody would agree has no waves in it, but just look at it in a, in a boosted reference frame, and you will see that the flux on the pointing vector across suitable time like three surfaces is not equal to zero. So you would say that well, across those surfaces, there is flux of momentum and therefore there, there are waves. It's a wrong conclusion. The right conclusion is to go to Scry. If, if you went to Scry, and if you take this Coulomb field, that I, this field that I've given you, the Coulomb field of a point charge, then <clears throat> this field that I've... If you go to Scry, you'll find that indeed there is no one upon R part of the field, and therefore there is no gravitational waves. So for this field, you will actually show, I, you, you can check, and I urge you to show that phi two naught is equal to zero, or phi two naught hat, or phi two naught is equal to zero, sorry, not phi two naught hat. Phi to naught equal to zero. So phi to naught, remember, is phi to hat is equal to phi to naught divided by r. So one upon r part of phi to naught actually is equal to zero. So you, even here, even for Maxwell field, you really have to go to infinity to know if there is actually electromagnetic waves or not. This is not emphasized enough, and therefore I'm saying this. Is this clear, or do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Thank you so much. Okay. And we're going to see that. For the full nonlinear general relativity, you will have notion of gravitational waves as well as the energy they carry away, etc., or momentum, angular momentum, uh, in a, at, 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 at null infinity at sky. Other questions? Okay, so just to just just because we, we should stop for a few minutes now, in a break between the two lectures. I really urge you guys, I cannot see you, uh, but I urge you to raise your hands and be candid and don't be embarrassed. I mean, I want these lectures to be useful to you. So if you think I'm going too slow, please raise your hands. Adam, tell me if there are lots of hands or few hands or no hands. Oh, there is a hand. Wait a second. <laughs> there is just one hand? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Wait a second. S second. Uh, more, more people who think I'm going too slow. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, uh, so maybe that will overlap with the next lectures and it w wouldn't be uh, pertinent to ask the question now, but uh, is are there some complications in more general space times or basically this procedure generalizes to some large class? So we did this analysis for Minkowski. That's right. called in different space times almost by, I don't know, trivial extension of the process. Yes. Very good question. So for the Maxwell field, this extends to general, globally, hyperbolic, asymptotically flat space times. Uh, and I'm going to define what asymptotically flat means. Uh, and there are you know, there's many space times that we know talk, talk about are asymptotically flat. So this notion of waves uh, in full nonlinear general relativity extends also for, for electromagnetic waves or scalar phase waves that extends for test Maxwell or for Maxwell fields. They don't have to be test even. Uh, Maxwell fields could contribute to the stress energy tensor and could co contribute to the curvature. If space time is asymptotically flat, these methods extend trivially for Maxwell fields. For gravitational field itself, things are a little bit more subtle, and we are going to see that in the main part of the course. Did I answer the question, or do you have a follow up? Yes. And maybe for like cosmological applications. Very good. What's what's the problem? <clears throat> for example, the sitter or anti the sitter. Uh, maybe it's <clears throat> what goes wrong. <clears throat> so there are two questions here. The first is about cosmological cosmology in general. And if you think about cosmology in general, which are which is not necessarily the sitter, right? Because usual cosmology is Friedman, Robertson, Walker. That can be cosmologically constant. But still, there is a matter field all over the place. So these space times are not asymptotically flat. So we can talk about electromagnetic fields on this space time, and we can for linearized for electro and for linearized gravitation field or electromagnetic fields, we can we can carry out what is known as the transverse or transverse and longitudinal for electromagnetic fields and transverse traceless and longitudinal decomposition for the gravitational field. For linearized fields, we can do that. It's a very non-local notion. So if you just give me the field in a row, I cannot tell you what this transverse part is. But we can do that. We can get the, trans the carrier. If you, give me the, if you give me the field everywhere, I can extract this transverse part, and that represents radiation. Yeah, that, that represents the radiation mode. But for the full nonlinear general relativity, there are really problems. And maybe we can discuss this at the end of, uh, uh, after I've done the asymptotically flat case with lambda equal to zero, right? Because at that time, then I can be more careful and tell you what is it that goes through and what is it that we don't know. But it would be much better to do it after I've done uh, the lambda equal to zero case rather than now because we, <laughs> Yeah, because we need that background material. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, so is is the conclusion that the speed is is okay, or should I slow down or go faster? It seems it's okay. It's okay. Okay, let's break for ten minutes and and start again at uh, four o'clock your time, right? So we break. Um. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So lecture two. <clears throat> uh, by the way, I already sent lecture one and two to you, and I will send you lecture three and four today so that you can have, a, if you have time, I mean, please have a look at it so that you can ask me more informed questions. <clears throat> so as, as we saw, what we need is a notion of asymptotic flatness. And this notion of asymptotic flatness, we just did Minkowski space time, and we want to now go to more general space time. And what I'm going to do is to tell you the notion. <clears throat> the notion which is mathematically um, compact and is kind of suffices to do everything we want to do for radiation, not only for Maxwell and say other zero response fields, neutrinos, for example, or scalar fields, but also for full nonlinear gravitation field. 
So first, I'm going to just drop the definition on you from sky, from sky, so to say. Um, and uh, this is it, it says, and then we'll see that in fact we can get everything we want uh, in in the radiation theory starting from this definition. So now I'm changing the notation. Previously, I called m g a b to be the physical space time, but now I, I would like since we're going to be working mostly with the conformally rescale space time, I'm calling the physical space time now. I'm calling with tilde. So there's a change of notation from the first slide to this slide. The physical space time quantities will have tildes on them. So we'll say that physical space time is asymptotically flat at null infinity. If we can attach to it a boundary, so you start with the physical space time and we attach it to a boundary, and the, the topology of the boundary is S2 cross R. <coughs> Sorry, just one second. Topology of the boundary is S2 cross R, such that the following very simple conditions hold. First of all, there is a, a conformally rescale metric. And again, it's just given my conformal factor, omega squared times the physical metric. And these are signature, these are signature minus plus plus plus. Um, <clears throat> same as signature as the physical space-time metric. But omega is smooth on the on the uh, on, on the entire manifold, a completion manifold uh, up here. And omega is equal to zero on the boundary. And the fact that omega is equal to zero on the boundary, <clears throat> that says that g tilde and, and, and g is smooth and omega is equal to zero, that tells you that the physical metric is not going to be well defined at the boundary, just as what we saw in the Minkowski space. Because the boundary is at infinity with respect to the physical space time, <clears throat> the physical metric is not well defined there. So omega equals zero, <coughs> but grade omega is not equal to zero. So what we're saying, Is basically giving you the rate at which omega falls off. Roughly speaking, what this is telling us in Minkowski space time, what this corresponds to is that omega goes like one upon r. If omega were to go like one upon r squared, then grad omega would also be zero at scrap. Or in terms of the phys in, in terms of the conformally rescale space time m, it says that omega is a good coordinate, right? It's a, Scry is a level surface of, of, of omega. So omega equals zero. So scry is a le level surface of omega. And grad omega is not equal to zero. And the second condition is just on the matter stress area tensor that the stress area tensor of the physical space time falls off at some rate. Namely, it falls like in Minkowski space, it will be like one upon r squared. So this the tensor field is actually smooth as scry. Now, for most physically interesting space times, you can have maxwell fields, scalar fields in, in Minkowski space, or you can have neutrino fields, and you, you can check that this, this stationary tensor condition is satisfied. So it's not really restrictive. But in fact, in most of our work, most of our discussion, we're just going to assume vacuum equations, so there is no stationary tensor at all. Therefore, this condition will be trivially satisfied. But we can generalize everything I'm going to say to this particular case. Now, this definition is astonishingly simple. <clears throat> Those of you who are familiar with the historical development of the field <coughs> will recall that in Penrose's notion of asymptotic simplicity, um, one, looked, one had to look at all the geodesics and scry was supposed to be the end point of all future directed ge geodesics. And then to accommodate uh, black holes, you have to modify them, modify this definition because some geodesics actually fall into the black hole. And therefore, it led to the notion of weakly asymptotic and simple. We're not talking about geodesics at all. <coughs> that is very surprising that we can still do everything we need to do. Similarly, in bondi sachs framework, we have got coordinate systems, we have got null surfaces, u equal to constant going out to infinity, and we are giving the fall off of the metric components, quite intricate thing. Nothing is here. The, all those things are just absorbed into the condition that G be well-defined at, at null infinity. <clears throat> so 
So as I said, intuitively, you can think of it as omega is equal to one upon R. We don't have an R. So if you like, you can give an omega, you can introduce R by this particular notion up here. And then sky plus is going to be coordinated by three coordinates, which you can take to be U theta phi. The topology is S2 cross R. So theta phi refer to S2 and U refers to R up here. So as I said, in this lecture, I will assume that T tilde vanishes in the neighborhood of sky for simplicity, but everything would go through with this weak condition. So here is a picture of a compact binary. Here is a compact binary that is going out up here. And here they, they, they coalesce and they form a um, single black hole, which then settles down. And then we've got radiation going out to infinity up here. <clears throat> so U is going up here like that, and theta and phi are going like that. And um, so in Schwarzschild space time, for example, we can just use a tortoise coordinate and define u is equal to t minus r. And then, uh, then, the state, then we can just write down the physical Schwarzschild metric in the u uh, r coordinates, u r theta phi coordinates, and you get this particular form. Then you can just set omega equal to one upon r, like in Minkowski space, and therefore the Confirm the rescale metric is going to be omega squared times the physical metric. And you can check that that metric is perfectly well defined at scry. And at scry, omega is equal to zero. So at scry, the metric is just given by this exactly like in Minkowski space. It is the, the, the information of the mass is in this omega squared term, which is further down, deep, deeper down up here. <clears throat> and you can go to scry along u equal to u naught and r equal to infinity. And if you wanted to use sky minus, then you can use V, which is T plus R star. So <clears throat> exercises for you to do this intermediate calculations. And also those of you who are a little more advanced should look at the curve shield form of the metric, first short shield and the full curve metric, if you like, and check that, in fact, you can, you can do the conformal rescaling of the Minkowski space, which is underlying Kirchhoff space time, and you'll get scra, and that scra is the same as the one you get by looking at the full uh, short shape. And the same thing is true for curve. So please do, do this exercise. That is a little thing that grounds you, uh, but at least for short shield, if not for curve. Okay, so it's a very simple definition, but it has very interesting consequences. <clears throat> and the consequences are the following. <clears throat> First of all, what we can do is the following. <clears throat> Near infinity, the physical Ricci tensor vanishes. But now I got a <clears throat> way of, I, can, I got conformal transformation properties. See, for example, Wall's book, Appendix D up here, um, which says that because the metric is conformally related to the physical metric by this particular way, the physical Ricci tensor of this metric is related <coughs> to the Ricci tensor of the, of the conformally rescale metric by this particular formula. So this is the exercise that I give you. It is, it involves second derivatives of the conformal factor and it involves, of course, the, the, the metric itself in, in many places. <clears throat> so you check this and uh, explicitly that this is how the conformal transformation properties work. Uh, this is really important for you to understand this. So now at scry, I will often use a notation with a hat here, equality with a hat. It means that it only holds at points of scry. So omega is equal to zero on scry and GB, GAB is smooth on scry. Um, that has very strong consequences. Now what we're going to do is to, in, in, in Minkowski space, in, throughout space time, we had this null tetrad. Now we don't have null tetra, but what I'm going to do is to just define a vector field Na to be GAB grad omega. This Na is not even null in the space time. I'm just defining it to be the gradient of omega. Then since GAB is omega squared G tilde IB, upstairs G tilde IB is equal to omega squared and GAB. Therefore, if I just put here G tilde IB and I expand it out, I will just get this to be equal to omega squared times scalar curvature. And here I get omega and here I get omega. 
So you can see that if I take now at sky, then omega is equal to zero, omega equal to zero. Therefore, I just get the condition that n dot n is equal to zero on sky, which means <clears throat> n is just the gradient of omega. Omega is equal to constant on sky. So n is normal to sky, and it says that not normal is a, in fact null. So the, the sky is, therefore, it's null, it's normal is null, therefore sky is a null three surface. Uh, in answer to a question that was asked a little bit before, if lambda is bigger than zero, then it turns out that the that n dot n is less than zero, and therefore sky is uh, space-like. Uh, so if lambda is bigger than zero, so in the Desita case, sky is space-like, and in the anti Desita case, sky is time-like. And this simple fact causes a lot of problems in defining, in going to develop the radiation theory in, uh, in presence of cosmology constant. That if we have time, at the very end, we can discuss. So now, what I did here was, I, can, I, I just contracted this with respect to G tilde IAB. But now I can also just multiply this equation by omega. And when I multiply this equation by omega and take the limit to scry, these terms will go away. And this term will just be grad omega grad omega, and this term will be proportional to GAB. So it says that grad omega grad omega is the same as uh, grad A omega, grad A grad B omega is the same as grad A and B, just because of our definition. So it says that grad A and B is proportional to the metric itself. And because it is proportional to the metric as scry, it means that the proportional factor is, of course, just I just contract it to, to say the proportional factor should be just divergence. So it's pure divergence, <clears throat> grad A and B. <clears throat> but we have conformal freedom. If you give me a space time which satisfies my, my conditions up here, I can just make a conformal transformation. Omega goes to little omega times omega, where little omega is just some smooth function. And little omega is not equal to zero as scry. <clears throat> Um, the little omega is not equal to zero as sky because I know that grad A omega, capital omega, is required not to be equal to zero. In other words, capital omega should be <clears throat> a good coordinate. So capital omega is a good coordinate. Capital omega prime is a good coordinate. Therefore, little omega cannot be zero. So it's a smooth, but not equal to zero at sky. And what we can... This is an exercise to check that I can always choose a little omega such that the divergence of n, n prime, the new rescale of n prime, n prime is just given by grad A of omega prime is equal to n prime. So um, that, that this can always be, be made equal to zero. This is a scalar equation. I got a scalar de degree of freedom. So it's plausible, but in fact, it's true. But now Einstein's equation, which we used here, this is equal to zero. They tell us that grad and n is, is uh, proportional to g. Therefore, grad, grad prime of n prime is also proportional to g prime ab. But in fact, if grad prime n prime is equal to zero, grad prime, then, then grad prime of n prime up here should also be equal to zero. So we can always go to a conformal frame just by choosing a suitable conformal factor such that n is actually covariantly constant just at scrap, not everywhere, just at, not in the neighborhood of scrap, but just at scrap. Does the field equations near scrap imply that scrap is a null three surface and we can always choose a conformal frame, which is divergence free? Now, what is the restricted conformal freedom? I can go from omega to omega prime to be equal to little omega times omega, such that little omega is smooth and non zero at scrap. And grad A and A equal to zero, and grad prime A and prime A equal to zero. But you can check that this can be always done if little omega as scry does not depend on u. If omega is just a function of theta and phi, if Lee n of omega is equal to zero. So we still have confound freedom left, which is really omega goes to little omega, which is smooth of function only of theta and phi times capital omega as scry. That's the that's freedom that I got up here. <clears throat> so in the divergence-free conformal frame, scry is just a cylinder. Theta and phi go like that. And u goes up and down the cylinder. And I, this is just a fiducial cross-section that I've chosen. Uh, you can choose some other fiducial cross-section. And you'll get another, no, another 
a fine parameter u along sky here. Now in the literature, one often restricts the conformal freedom by demanding that the two metric, so I got a two metric at sky, which is just the pullback of the metric that we just talked about, just uh, somewhere here when we say sky is a null surface, the two metric is null up here. So let me just, did I ever talk about two metric here? So maybe I should just write it down explicitly here. Um, yeah, the two metric, is now, it's right, right here. The two metric at sky is just the pullback of this metric. And as I mentioned it to you before in Minkowski space time, there's this metric as which is zero plus plus. Same thing is true here because sky is a null surface. So the only non-trivial components are the ones along theta and phi, d by d theta and d by d phi. So, uh, so, so what we can do is to take this metric and restrict it to such cross sections such that the metric is actually unit. So I can just use this conformal freedom that is left over to make the, this to be a unit two sphere metric. In other words, the scalar curvature <coughs> of the new met two metric is equal to two. So if I make the scalar curvature is equal to two, then that you know is really a strong conformal freedom up here. And you can make sure that it is true that you can the solutions always exist. You can always solve this equation. And in fact, there is a three parameter for a family of solutions to this thing, which I have written down here explicitly. Alphas are constants. Alphas are just given by alpha, which subject to the condition alpha zero squared plus alpha one squared plus alpha two squared plus alpha three squared equal to minus one. And this ri is just a vector whose components are sine theta, sine theta, to cos phi, sine theta, sine phi, cos, cos theta. This is a unit radial vector. So what we can always do is the following. Given a conformal, given a symptotically flat space, first we can always go to a divergence-free conformal frame in which the null normal is covariant constant. And we can, we have still a conformal freedom, which is a function of theta and phi. And we can reduce this further by making the two-sphere metric appear to be a unit two-sphere metric. And we are, people often do that. And they, this is called the Bondi conformal frame, in which the two sphere metric, in the metric up here is that of a unit two sphere metric. It has an advantage in that all the formula can be written down explicitly in terms of sine theta, cos theta, et cetera, et cetera. The disadvantage is basically that it is difficult to check conformal invariance of this property because the restricted conformal freedom is, is rather complicated. And so, make sure that a particular formula you, you wrote down is conformally invariant. It's a little bit more complicated because the conformal freedom is restricted by this particular formula and you have to substitute this in order to make sure that the formula is conformally invariant. So there are pluses and minuses and we'll use both, both things in which sky is divergence free only or sky is also in the bond frame. Now, relation to the older literature. <clears throat> So in the older literature, that like from Bondi and Sachs and Newman and Anti, that some of you are more familiar with, there is no conformal completion. So the sky is not actually a boundary up here, well, only deals with the physical space time. And one always, sky corresponds to just taking the limit as R goes to infinity. So U equal to constant and R goes to infinity. So the, the point is that, however, what we can do is to, Work, work backwards. Namely, supposing you are given a conformal completion, as I just told you, then we can introduce coordinates u, theta, phi, and omega in a neighborhood of scra. Namely, we can take, fix some cross-section, call it u equal to u naught, this cross-section, and then just because you've got n, you can take d by du, and therefore you've got u equal to constant cross-sections up here. And now given a cross-section, to this cross section, this vector n a is tangential, and therefore there is another null normal to the two sphere up here. That is, and I take the past direct. I could take the future directed one, but I'm just taking the past directed one, which goes in the physical space time. So this uh, minus l a, if you like, l a is future directed, so minus l a is past directed. So I can just take this uh, this vector field, go in the physical space time, and I can just lead drag theta and phi along here. And keep and u also u theta phi up here, 
So that I'll obtain the coordinates u theta. So this will be given by u equal to u naught. And I also have coordinates theta and phi here, which I just lead drag. Okay. <clears throat> so that's what we're done. Lee L of u equal to zero, theta equal to zero, theta equal to phi zero. And then finally, you are given me a conformal completion. So I have an omega. So I can just set omega equal to one upon r. So I got u coordinate, theta coordinate, phi coordinate, and r coordinate in the physical space time. Then exercise, you can show that just because the, the conformally rescale metric is well defined on scry, then the physical metric, which is g tilde IAB is equal to omega squared, omega to the minus two times GAB. GAB is a conformally rescale metric. Then you can say that the physical metric has a certain expansion, du squared, du dr, uh, and then this is a two sphere metric plus some correction term. So you can show that if I just introduce a chart like that, knowing that the metric GAB was a conformal completion of an asymptotically flat space time, you can show that the physical space time must have an expansion like that in that particular chart. Now you can see here that I got here F1, F2, and then I got this Qs up here. Uh, sorry, Q is just a unit to sphere metric. So I got H, Hs, which are corrections to this Qs up here. And I also have this FAs up here. So you can count the number of freedom we I got up here. And you will see that there are seven. Basically, there are two here. There are three in HAB because a, a capital A capital B refers to angular coordinates. So I got three here. So there are five. And FA is again a angular coordinate, and that therefore there is seven up here. So basically, we you know we are chosen some. I mean, we are led to <coughs> this form of the metric by choosing some coordinates. So it fix the coordinates, but there is still one degree of freedom left because the metric has ten components, and we have got a four-dimensional coordinate freedom, and that component corresponds to setting. Uh, so and, and therefore there is a there is a freedom, and this extra freedom, namely we can still, can still impose one coordinate condition to eliminate, eliminate the full coordinate freedom. And that was done by further restriction. And there are two choices, a Newman anti choice and Bondi Sachs choice. And Newman anti choice just says that um, LA grade of R, R, R. So basically, by, we started with R, they make a coordinate transformation to R bar. Uh, is a function of r such that this is an affine parameter for the vector field that we got here, L tilde vector field that we got up here, that the vector field that we got up here, up here. And so that is one choice. And the other choice is to ask that, uh, this is called the luminosity distance, and that just asks that the determinant of the two metric that we got up here, these are two metric on the on the on, on the on sky at infinity uh, sorry the, the two metric yeah on, on sky in the neighborhood of infinity we want to make the determinant to be equal to plus one so basically these are the two coordinate choices that people have made in the literature and the details are not important the, the, what is important is that given an asymptotic in flat space time i can introduce some co some cross section carry on uh, drag that cross section by d by du and therefore I get u equal to constant cross sections. I can introduce some theta phi coordinate on one cross section, drag them by theta and phi. So on scry, I got u theta phi, and I can drag those coordinates down up here by just asking that they be constant along this geodesics. And finally, um, uh, that, that immediately tells me that the metric has this form, but there is still one degree of freedom, one coordinate freedom that is left and I can use another coordinate condition, and this is what people have done. We're not going to use these coordinate conditions. This is just because some of you are probably familiar with these bond type expansions or Newman anti-type expansions, and this makes an explicit connection between the coordinate-free approach of conformally com completions and, uh, and, 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 and what we have done here. So the coordinate expansions one finds in the literature can be arrived at starting from the conformal completion in a systematic geometrical fashion, and the extra input corresponds to fixing the restricted conformal freedom in a neighborhood of scratch by, 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 this, by, by these coordinate conditions. Okay, so now we have this 
just like in the Maxwell case, we are peeling properties here also. We would like to understand if there are peeling properties. Are there any questions on the first part? The first part, the non-trivial thing was just this definition, which is astonishingly simple. This definition, which is astonishingly simple. And, uh, but then, you know, it does not refer to null geodesics or coordinates or anything like that. And yet we could conclude that scry is actually null and we could go to a conformal frame in which scry is divergence free or the null normal is covariantly constant. And then from that, we can make contact with the older literature. That is a basic, basically what I've seen shown so far. Are there any questions? Adam, can I go on? Yeah. Okay, so I'll go on. Um, <clears throat> so now, again, we're looking at consequences um, of, the, the, of, of, the, of the, our asymptotic flatness definition. Um, and then again, the, the point is that we can again single out the radiation field and the peeling properties. But now in exact general relativity, just as what we did for Maxwell theory in Minkowski space time. So we can fix an asymptotically flat space time and a conformal completion where scry is divergence free. So this is equal to zero. And this, of course, implies by field equations, this implies also that grad A and B is also equal to zero at scry. <laughs> Now, the, the, the physical Riemann tensor can always be written down. This is just an identity, while part and the Ricci part. And the Ricci part is written using the Schouten tensor. Now, field equations imply that the physical space Schouten tensor or the Ricci tensor is equal to zero. Um, and we can now just rewrite, see the relation between the physical space Ricci tensor and the conformally rescaled Ricci tensor. And the, and the, if I just forget about this for a moment, the, the relation is just this. So this is an exercise for you to check uh, that this is true, that the relation is just this up here. Um, so now what I can do is to multiply this, this equation by omega and take its curve. By curl, I mean, just basically take the derivative times uh, and, and anti-symmetrize on A and B uh, on, on this and this is up here. So if I like, here, I'll take grad C and anti A and C, if you like. If I did that, this is an exercise. You can quickly check that the wild tensor has the property that omega times this times wild tensor times ND is equal to zero. Therefore, at scry, omega is equal to zero. The, the Ricci part or the Schouten part of the conform metric GAB is smooth. Therefore, at scry, we just include that the wild tensor of the and formally rescale space time must satisfy the condition that when plugged with n, I get zero. Now, this is a more non trivial exercise. This is straightforward. Uh, namely, that the Bianchi identity plus the condition that we have got S2 cross R topology of scry, that implies that if, wild, if this, all these components of the wild tensor are zero, then wild tensor itself is zero. Let me just say a little thing in the parenthesis up here. If I if scribe a space like, like for example, in the in the in the uh, uh, asymptotically distributed case, then in fact I can define the electric and magnetic parts of the wild tensor using the space like normal, and it would be the normal to scribe, and then this condition immediately implies that EAB equal to zero and BAB equal to zero. And that immediately implies the wild tensor is equal to zero. So if, if lambda were bigger than zero or less than zero, then this is true. And I can immediately say that the wild tensor is zero. If lambda is equal to zero, then unfortunately this condition doesn't really determine completely the, uh, this condition doesn't determine completely the, the 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 wild tensor itself, and we have to use the topology. Whereas in lambda bigger than zero and less than zero, this is just a, a local condition, local consequence that we we don't need this uh, topology. But in any case, it is a fact that irrespective of the value of lambda, the wild tensor at scry is identically zero is a consequence of our definition of asymptotic flatness. 
Now, if something is equal to zero, then by L'Hopital rule, uh, omega to, omega is a good coordinate. So omega to the minus one times wild tensor has a smooth limit to scratch. And this is called the asymptotic wild curvature. Now, in contrast with Maxwell field, where f is equal to f hat ab, so the asymptotic Maxwell field was equal to f or f hat is the same. Whereas here, the asymptotic wild tensor, wild curvature, is really given by omega to the minus one times c a b c d. And that is why there is a lot of difference between the Maxwell theory and general relativity. There are many similarities, but there are also differences. Now, at SCRI, as I said, what we can do is we can take this, we can take this K B C D, which is asymptotic wild tensor, and I plug to it two null normals. The resulting quantity I call I'm calling K B. Now, clearly, if I plug another null normal, <coughs> I would get zero because this is anti-symmetric in A and B and anti-symmetric in C and D. Therefore, this is K B is transverse. And, and, and it is a tensor field on scry and it's traceless. So it's a transverse trace, traceless tensor field on scry. To begin with, if you like, it's a three-dimensional tensor. Sky is three-dimensional, it's a symmetric tensor field. So it would have six components. This says three of them are zero, and traceless condition says that another one of them is zero. So six minus three minus one is, is, is two. So we're just left with two components. And you can, if you like these two components, I can do it. I can take them. What I'm doing is I'm taking KB and I'm pulling it back to scry. Therefore, if you like, the only components that will be here will be theta phi. Um, and because D by DU will be zero, so there'll be only theta phi. These are the two components. And you can think of them as being electric part of the wild tensor. But as I said, it's circular because the electric part is defined with respect to the null normal. But keeping that in mind, it is the electric part of the wild tensor. And only components which are non-zero are the angular components because n is identically zero and I already pulled it back to scry. So all I have is u theta phi. And, and if I have contact with u, I get zero. So I just have theta phi up here and it's traceless. It has only two components. So comparison to Maxwell field, I take F, A, B, and B there, and I can pull back F, and it has two components, which I can call E, B, and these two components were phi to naught. Um, now, Maxwell field E, B is a one form on scry plus, defined intrinsically because I pulled it back. But convenient, inconvenient uh, to, in practice, to write its components in the null tetra. So I could just live with this, but I just plug into it M bar B, and that gives me a phi to naught. So therefore, we, we use phi to naught. Uh, from scry perspective, we can start with a cross section, and I can u equal to u naught, and I can define this coordinate, this this tetron vec vectors, m m bar, such that m m bar times a two sphere metric on that cross section is equal to zero, or m m times that equal to zero, and m m bar equal to one. Uh, so, and then we can lead drag them along. Scry, and then I can get here um, a null tetra all over scry, and this phi to naught is just the component of you can check from the last lecture is just the component of f, which is really a pullback of which, which is this quantity up here along m bar, or that is the same as the component of e b. I, capital B means it's only theta phi components, and then b here is only theta phi components. But of course, this depends on the choice of what am I choose up here? And that means that this is actually quantity, which is which has spin away. The number of m bars that we got up here, uh, each m gives you spin weight one and m bar gives you spin weight minus one. So here I got one m bar, therefore this has spin weight minus one. In gravitational field, in exact general relativity, the same procedure used, um, again, for convenience is that I had this vector field, a tensor field KB. It has only two components. When I pull it pull back to scry, it has only two components up here. And what I can do is to uh, take those that and just just plug into it m bar m bar. It is straight split. Therefore, if I take m m m m bar, I'll get zero. So I can either pl plug into m bar m bar or m m, and that's it. And so 
this is a complex quantity and that depends of course on the choice of m bar and i got two m bars and therefore it has it is said to have failure weight two so i can just play with this tensor and pull it back to scry and therefore i get an object, object which i will call eab up here at scry or i can use the newman penrose tetras and i can do this and then i can get a function based on function which has a spin weight minus two um, and this is uh, this is ready this is convenient in numerical relativity for example and it is used heavily in the gravitational wave literature and psi 4 naught is called the radiation field and it has two radiative degrees of freedom the physical null tetrad is given by n tilde is equal to n so i'm here we're doing the opposite now we start with the conformally rescale null tetra and i'm just defining a physical space time null tetra because i know what the relations were from minkowski space if you like then i'll get this null tetra to be to be a, a null tetra of the physical metric g tilde ab uh, which is a physical metric which is omega to the minus two times the conformally rescale metric up here and then psi four i can just plug into it the physical tetra up here and i can see that psi 4, just in the physical psi 4 is the newman penrose psi 4, is given by psi 4 naught, because if I just put here uh, the, 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 the physical quantities up here, uh, sorry, if I substitute it for them in terms of the uh, conformally rescale fields, which are well defined at scry, then I will find that this is equal to psi 4 naught upon r plus 1 upon r squared. And this is the same as kb times m bar a, m bar b upon r plus that or EAB times M bar A, M bar B. These are just angular coordinates. And uh, these are kind of space-time coordinates, if you like. Uh, they are the same. Uh, the, 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 numerically, they will turn out to be, to be the same. So this is now the radiation field, which falls like 1 upon R. And just like in Maxwell theory, we just took the Maxwell field and plugged into it N and M. Here, I'm plugging again N and M except that there are two n's and two m's now, because the wild tensor has four components. And it turns out that that psi 4 naught, that component is in fact false like one upon r. And just like in Maxwell theory, this is what carries information about radiation. Now using field equations, one can find potentials for this, uh, for this KEB. And these potentials are heavily used in the numerical relativity waveform and, and waveform models. The first potential, for the for this radiation fields k or psi four uh, is called the bondy news and again it is symmetric and traceless transverse therefore it only has theta phi components and therefore i can write the theta phi components as just a b and again there are only two components because this is also traceless and this potential um, actually is such that the what we have got here e a b the the, the radiation field is the time derivative of this thing. It's just the Lien of, of NAB. So NAB is called the bonding news and its time derivative gives me the radiation field. And what NAB is, is really just the Schouten tensor, but the components which are just tangential angular components, theta phi of the Schouten tensor. And that is what what NAB is. NAB is just equal to uh, Lien of SAB. This one half could be taken out just like it was taken out. So we're just taking the shout in terms. Huh? And um, this is for those of who know a little bit more that Garosh had introduced a tensor rho AB to remove the conformally non invariant part of F, the shout in tensor. And, but in the bonding frame, that in fact, rho AB is just the, the metric and therefore, I can just take the trace-free part of the, of the shout and tensor in the, in the bondy frame. This is just a side remark for the experts. So if I take, if I can, if I take this and if I just put two M bars into it, then I just get that the radiation field is given by the time derivative of what is called as news. And the news has these two components, angular components, which are trace-free. And they can be written as, I should have written here, AB, capital A, capital B, so let me get to that. Okay, so 
the state manager, I can just expand this out because it has only angular parts. And so when I expand this out, I will just get um, a, 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 a spin weighted scalar. Since a, n itself has no spin weight, but since these two quantities are spin weight minus two, therefore little n up here has spin weight plus two. And then there is a second potential. I got already one potential up here. And the second potential is really n itself is a time derivative. We saw that the radiation field is a time derivative of the news. And the news itself is a time derivative. So the radiation field is the second time derivative of this new field. And this new field is called sigma. And this sigma is a shear of the vector field L that we talked about. This vector field L that we talked about is the shear of that vector field. Namely, if I look at its components along mm bar, for example, the components is just, so I just taking this and then plugging it into it, uh, m bar a, m bar b, uh, then I obtain this thing called sigma naught. So this sigma naught has, <clears throat> sigma naught bar has spin weight minus two. So sigma naught itself has spin weight two. Um, and so and, and th th that is the, uh, uh, the definition that we got up here. And, uh, and, and that waveform that you will find in waveform models and so on, it just construct, it just corresponds to the sigma naught. This sigma naught bar is just given by sigma naught times mm. And that it just corresponds to the plus polarization minus i, the, uh, the uh, uh, cross polarization, u theta phi. And the helicity is, is minus two just because of the m bars up here. In the physical space time, this shear corresponds to just taking the, the leading part of the, of the metric, which is deviation from Minkowski space, and just multiplying it by r. Because the leading part of the metric, the waveform, if you like, falls like one upon r, again, is because of the radiation field. And that is what is sigma naught. So what we have seen so far is that we're just following what we did in the Maxwell theory. And we got psi 4. Psi 4 is a radiation field obtained by two n's and two m bars. It has a first potential, which is called the bondy news. The derivative of the bondy news is psi four. The news itself has a potential, which is shear. The derivative of the shear is equal to news. And therefore the radiation field is a second time derivative of the, of the of news and uh, of uh, shear. And this shear can be thought of as just the metric as we just saw up here. So finally, the Coulombic part up here. So let me talk about the Coulombic part. So I talked about the radiation part. What about the Coulombic part? So in the Maxwell theory, the Coulombic part was given by phi one naught. These are the fields which fall like one upon r squared, like the coefficient of one upon r squared up here. And that is obtained by just taking FABNA times LB or E times L. So here, psi two naught, is a Coulombic part, and it is obtained again by taking k with two l's, and here I had only one n, uh, l up here, and now I got two l's. Just because the wild tensor has four components, and Maxwell field has only two components. So it is really just like here it was e times l, here it is e times ll. So this is the 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 total the total the energy momentum of a space-time, not the radiated part, but the two-sphere integral of this quantity will give you the bondy mass, bondy mass or bondy energy and bondy three momentum of this thing. So this is really Coulombic, just like this is Coulombic. Integral of this gives a charge, and we'll see that the integral of this gives you the energy and momentum. In the physical space-time, this was, as we saw, because of the relation between the tetras in the physical and the conformally rescale space time, this real part of phi one in the physical space time falls like one upon r squared. Similarly, here you can just check the what happens with n's and l's, and you will find that this corresponds to the real part of psi two naught upon r cube. In the curved space time, imaginary part of uh, sorry, real part of psi two, which is what this is up here, uh, is just given by so this this part up here is just given by minus gm upon r cube. So this is the Coulombic part. It has information about the mass. But now in uh, nonlinear relativity, there's also another field which carries information, which is Coulombic information. 
and it has the angular momentum information, just like this and mass information. And that is obtained by taking, here we have two Ns and two Ls. Now we have two Ls, one N and one N. So more Ls, more Coulombic you get. So now this, is, if you like, is even more Coulombic because I got two Ls up here. Sorry, uh, I, this is even more Coulombic because I got uh, less Ns. Here I got two Ns and now I only have one N here. And the, and in the physical space, then this, I can just convert these null tetras and we find that in the physical space time, this falls like one upon r to the fourth. And this has the information about angular momentum. So in curved space time, for example, it is 3i upon 2r to the fourth times sine theta times g times capital J. Capital J is the total angular momentum, which is m times a, little a parameter. So what we have done here is seen that the procedure used in the Maxwell field can be repeated. And that repeating that procedure gives us, uh, uh, repeating that procedure gives us the, uh, uh, the radiative part of the Maxwell field as well as the Coulombic part of the Maxwell field. Um, uh, that, that procedure gives us the radiative part of the um, gravitational field as well as the Coulombic part of the gravitational field. So I'll stop here. And take any questions. There are some commonly asked questions which I have, I have in my slides, so you can go through that also. But I'll stop here and take any questions you have. Uh, yes, thank you very, for a very nice lecture. Uh, I guess I have uh, two kind of related questions. Please. So, so first one is uh, considering the these potentials uh, connected to the, in this news function and the shear. So are these uh, potentials introduced uniquely or there's some gauge freedom in choosing them? Uh, no, there's no gauge freedom in choosing the first potential, uh, which is news. The reason is because this news really comes from the curvature. If we are going to see in a little bit more detail that news is in fact coming from curvature very directly. I mean, you can see here because it came from this curvature up here. Um, so uh, it, 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 it has a much, much more natural origin than I have presented. I just sort of use the analogy with Maxwell field alone, but I, I because of basically because of time constraint, I did not go into too many details. Uh, uh, but in going from going from um, the news to the potential, there is gauge freedom. So let me just explain what that gauge freedom is in a minute. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, so the statement is that you give me scry. Oh, sorry. You give me scry, and you have some binary or so some source up here that is radiating things. So here I got scry plus. And then the statement is that it that on scry plus, I got this, I mean, you give me conformal completion, therefore I do have the vector field NA. That is given to me by the conformal completion because an A is just equal to grad A omega. Okay. Um, and then the statement is that the... Um, I, I can just really define this, as I said before, I can just define this quantity KB. And this only involves um, N, right? Because I just started looking at this to be equal to K, the K, B, K, C, B, D, N, C, N, D. And this is just the wild tensor of the, uh, the asymptotic wild tensor. And so this all gauge invariant, there's no problem at all. And the statement is that similarly, new tensor can be constructed directly from the Schouten tensor of the physical metric, of the conformally rescale metric. So if you are given me conformal completion, then there is no further freedom, gauge freedom is here and here. But to go to the news, but go to the shear, there is a freedom. So shear is obtained by taking, um, taking a cross-section, right? I, I took some cross-section, and then um, 
I basically um, looked at, if you give me any cross sections, then I, I already have an A vector field up here to that cross section, which is null normal. And then I get another null, null vector field, which I wrote like that before, which is minus L, but I, I could write it in the future directed one, I can write as L. So I got here, N is like that. And L is a other future directed vector field. So here I got a future directed vector fields everywhere here. And so what I can do is I can consider grad A, LB, which is the null normal. I can pull it back to the cross section and I can remove its trace. So this quantity is what shear is. But you see, in order to con construct this quantity, I have to choose a cross section. This refers to a cross section. The KB and the body news, they don't refer to a cross section. But this refers to a cross section. And so if I change the cross section, you don't like this cross section. Maybe you like a different cross section, which looks like, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, you look like you like a different cross section, which looks like that. Say. So this is some other cross section C prime. The first one was C. Now you got C prime cross section. Um, maybe I should make it darker. So I got here C prime cross section. And now I'm going to get different L. It is still going is so the statement this depends on L. And it is still true that if I take the n of sigma ab, or I, I can take the n of sigma l prime b, they actually turn out to be the same. It doesn't really depend on which cross sections are chosen. So these are the same, and they, they will both give me the news. But on sigma itself, sigma and sigma prime are quite different from each other. So for example, at this, at, 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 at the point I hear of intersection, I got L defined by, I got a vector field L defined by, um, uh, which, is, which is defined by uh, the green cross section. And I would also have a vector field L, which is going to be defined by, uh, by, the, by the black cross section. They're not equal to each other. And so therefore, in general, I mean, I, this is, in order to get the, the shear, of course, I, I don't have just one cross section. I got this green cross section, and then I, I'm going to translate it. And similarly, I got the black cross section, and I'm going to translate it to get shear everywhere. And therefore, the shear is, is going to be different from each other, and there's a gauge freedom here. And we can write down the transformation properties and so on and so forth between shear. Um, but as uh, but but as far as news is concerned, there is no gauge freedom. Is this clear, or do you have further questions? Yeah, that was very helpful. Thanks. Uh, could you just uh, go back to this slide number thirteen? This uh, yes, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so as we see here, that there's a first cross section and then, uh, sorry, first potential and then a second potential. The first potential is news. News does not depend on any extra structure. It is canonically defined. But in order to go to shear, I had to introduce L. And that is why it is not. So the waveforms uh, are really in, in a given. The waveforms that are given, they require a particular choice of L. They require a particular choice of. Um, they require a particular, either you make the green cross sections, so so maybe we can just remove the black one, say. You, you need a specific one, so let me just remove the black one. Um, this green cross sections. Yeah, 
that. So when people give you waveforms, they are giving you a particular, um, they're referring to a particular uh, u theta five like. So these are given by u equal to u naught, u equal to u one, and so on and so forth. So these are the cross sections that we got up here. U u con. So when people give you waveforms, they are using a particular u equal to u naught, u equal to u one, etc. And in fact, that you uh, typically they are also using a bondi conformal frame. So in a bondi conformal frame, you are, furthermore you are choosing a family of cross sections. Okay. Any other questions? Adam, uh, any yeah. hands up? Yeah. yeah. So my question is related to to the radiative field cipher. So I yeah. find I find it a little misleading to call the cipher uh, the radiative field in the following sense. So what happens if I have a constant an instancer along n. So suppose that I have some constant new instancer along n, but this tensor still has divergence, which should be related to psi 3. So why are not taking into the picture psi 3? I, I mean, we could also, psi 3 also has, I mean, they all have radiative content, right? I yeah. think I, I, I'm using the, so exactly, you are right. So psi three actually, yeah. if I look at, um, right, psi three is psi four. Psi three has information about news. And so it, it definitely is ready to contain. So psi three, psi four, and in, even the imaginary part of psi two, not the real part of psi two, all of them have radiative content. But the point is that <clears throat> the reason why it is called, psi four is called the radiation field is because it is freely specified. If you like, I mean, it's in the sense that what we are looking at is the following. Right? You've got a three manifold scry and we ask the following questions. What fields can I specify and scry as a three manifold freely? And what fields I need to specify also on a cross section, and then I will drag them out, drag them by, by field equations. And the statement is that if you know psi three on a cross, if, if you give me psi four, then I can, um, then the statement is that if you give me, I only need to know what psi three is on a given cross section. Mm -hmm. And then I, I know everything else. So that is the reason why psi four is called the the kind of the radiation field is because psi you know psi three not is equal to psi four if you like it's like the a little bit like motivated by a little bit by what happens in in the canonical phase space right uh, okay well, what is really freely specifiable uh, I, this, I'm sorry I, I don't want to go into that because that take me five minutes to explain it this too, too long. Uh, it is a terminology, and the terminology is really what can you specify freely, and then what can be obtained uh, by just uh, and by just solving linear differential equations. Uh, yeah, Done. yeah, okay. I, I I see the point. Yeah, I was just asking because um, yeah, because this I find this thing misleading. So that you can have a constant new tensor that gives you a psi three. And and having cipher equal to zero just because the new tensor is constant. So in principle, in this situation, you have gravitational radiation and cipher. So that's why I find this this somehow a little bit misleading. I understand uh, also the uh, point of of the of specifying the psi three just on on one section, and then you can you only need cipher. I, I see this point, but um, yeah, but I think that the 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 the, the space time you're talking about when new tensor is is, is constant. Yeah. That space time will not be asymptotically flat, really. Because if it were asymptotically flat, right, then I, I, I mean, it, it's, its ADM energy will be infinite. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because if the Bondi energy is finite on any one cross section, yeah. and the mm -hmm. news is constant, then so, so your space time is, I mean, you're just taking one condition from the 
asymptotic flatness, but your space time as a whole is not asymptotically flat. Okay. And okay. that is that the, the total energy radiated will be infinite. Total angular momentum radiated will be infinite. Total. Um, yeah, I, I agree. But, and consider just one cross section, one single cross section. Size but, can be zero there. Can be zero. Yeah. And, I can and still, I can have a non zero new tensor. And if I compare right. the bond energy, the bond Troutman energy in one cross section, I still have some uh, loss by gravitation, by loss of energy, <laughs> by gravitational waves on that cross -sex section. And Cypher is zero there. Yeah. So I think that the, the, um, I, I, I agree with you. But I mean, these statements about radiation and so on really refer to all of sky, not not only just given cross section. So I should not, I mean, just because it's not very meaning meaningful to say that. Or it is ambiguous to what you mean by saying that there is radiation on this cross section, but there is no radiation on this cross section. Uh, I think I think these things will become much more clearer, hopefully. When we yeah, thank talk you. about thank uh, the radiative you. modes in a in a in an invariant manner, right? Yeah, I I think I, what I'm using is really not uh, my terminology. Not my I I would prefer not to use cipher at all. I, I would just use this KAB and or this EAB or KAB, and that KAB has actually information about psi four, psi three, and imagined part of psi two, and all of that is a radiation field. So it's only when KAB is equal to zero. All of it is equal to zero. I would say that uh, that there is no radiation, uh, but I'm just using conveying to people the stand the terminology that is used by by most audience. But I really like such discussions because I think these are clarifying to the audience. So thank you. Are there more questions? Okay, I think there are no more questions. So thank Good. you. Bye. Right, and so I will send.